Hi everyone, welcome back to our part 2 tutorial video on simple statistics. In this video we'll be covering measures of spread and graphically displaying descriptive statistics in the forms of graphs, charts, and distributions. For our first measure of spread we're going to discuss the range. Now all the range is is it's the maximum or largest value minus the minimum or the smallest observation. R has a built-in function for the range, it's just called the range. And we're still working with the miles per gallon data set in the or the miles per gallon variable in the empty cars data set. And the range function in the output gives us the smallest value and the largest value. Now the range is the difference between the largest and smallest values, so let's correct for that. We'll take the maximum value, find it using the max function, and the minimum value, subtract it and subtract it from the minimum value using the min function. And here we have in our output the range or the difference between those two values is 23 and a half. A note of caution about the range, it is an extremely uninformative statistic and if you have outlying data or skewed data it is very uninformative and even when you don't. Say you have symmetric data or data that doesn't contain outliers it's just highly uninformative and we don't prefer it in many scenarios. A statistic that we do prefer is the variance. And all the variance is, it's, is it is the squared average deviations away from the mean. So let's take a moment to break that down. The squared average. So when we're talking about deviations away from the mean, we're talking about each outcome, so each miles per gallon observation, being subtracted from the overall mean of miles per gallon. We then square that difference, and then in the end, we take the sum of those squared deviations, and we average them. So we divide them by the number of observations there are. So the variance is the squared average deviations away from the mean. And that can be found using the var function in R and here is the output. So 36.3241 squared deviations away from the mean. Well, that's wonderful, but how do we interpret squared deviations? Turns out that all you need to do to unsquare some type of term or number is to put a square root over it. And that's what the standard deviation does, is it removes the squared property and returns the deviations to their original units. So the standard deviation represents the average deviations away from the mean. And that can be found using the SD function in R. So the standard deviation is 6.027 miles per gallon. So we can expect to find one standard deviation away from the mean to be 6.026 miles per gallon away from the mean. That's how you would interpret it. The third and final measure of spread that we'll be covering is the concept of a quantile. Now a quantile and a percentile are closely related, but they do have a bit different meanings. A percentile represents the proportion of data covered before reaching some certain number. So in the concept of quartiles, which is where I have the 25th percentile, the 50th percentile, and the 75th percentile, as well as the minimum and maximum values, the 25th percentile represents the point, or the miles per gallon value, where 25% of the data fall before that value. The 50th percentile, likewise, also called the median of the data set, is where 50% of values fall below that specific value. And the 75th percentile is where 75% of the data fall below or before that 75th percentile value. And we can determine these percentiles in the minimum and maximum by using the quantile function and specifying the probability vector 0, 25th percentile, 50th percentile, 75th percentile, and then the maximum which is 100% of our data. So calling that in and looking at our output we see that our minimum value, represented by the zero percentile, because there is no data before the minimum value, it is the smallest observation we can get. The minimum miles per gallon is 10.4.
and we can see that 25% of our data lie before 15.4 miles per gallon. So 25% of our cars earn less, get less, however you want to put it, but they earn less than 15.43 miles per gallon. 50% of our cars, represented by the median, which is 19.2 miles per gallon, have smaller miles per gallon than 19.2. And 75% of our cars have smaller miles per gallon than 22.8. And our largest miles per gallon getting car gets 33.9 miles per gallon. So that's one interpretation of quartiles. Another specialized version of a quantile is a quintile. Instead of having the 25th percentile, 50th and 75th, we now have the 20th, 40th, 60th, and 80th percentile. That is a quintile. So we'll store that information in quint, short for quintile. We'll call in the quantile function again and specify in our probabilities vector that we want the 20th percentile, the 40th, and so on. So I put that there. And now I want to mark these quintiles as vertical lines on one of our distributions, our density plots. So I'm going to color those lines. Our minimum and maximum values will be represented by vertical lines that are red and dashed. And our quintiles, right, the values representing our quintiles, will have green vertical lines. And we have four quintile values. And those colors will be stored in the vector called col vec. I'm going to plot my density distribution and I'm going to add my quintiles. So take note here that the vector in which I stored my, quant my quintiles in, I put that down as being the marker for where the vertical lines will originate. The color of those vertical lines are given by the vector Colvec. I want a line type of 2 which indicates I want dashed lines representing all of those vertical lines and I want my line width to be 3, so relatively thick lines that match the density plot. And when I put those together, here I have my distribution with marked quintiles. So the two red boundaries represent my minimum and my maximum value, respectively. And then the first green dash line represents the 20th percentile. So as we can see, the 20th percentile is marked by about uh, 15 miles per gallon, and you can always check up here too. The 40th percentile is marked by 17.9 miles per gallon, and so on. So that is how we plot a distribution with quintiles. Another way to obtain quartiles, right? So remember, there's a difference between quartiles and quintiles. Quartiles include the 25th, 50th, and 75th percentiles. And we can also achieve that using the summary function. So when I output the summary function. Here I have the first quartile equivalent to saying the 25th percentile, the median equivalent to saying the 50th percentile. I also get the mean, another important piece of data. And the distance between the mean and median can help and inform me whether my distribution is skewed or if it's symmetric. And then I have my third quartile and of course my minimum and maximum values. So that's the summary function and you can store that in a vector of its own. So you can either approach it using the quantile function if you want to be more specific or customizable with whichever percentiles you want, or you can just use the summary function to obtain quartiles and the mean. It's up to you. This next section and final section of chapter two is graphically presenting descriptive statistics using base R. So for this first example, we'll be creating density plots, an overall density plot, and also subpopulation density plots, dependent on cylinder, the number of cylinders in a car. I want our plots to be arranged in a two by two matrix. So that means if you were to visualize a matrix, I have four slots total in which I can have four plots stacked in a matrix. So I'm going to have two rows and two columns. And the way I set that out, that up is using the par function and specifying the option MF row equals C 
two, two. And you can think of MF row being like our matrix layout setup of having two rows and two columns. So I have a total of four plots or four elements. In the first plot, I have an overall density plot of miles per gallon. Let me include our layout. And here we have our layout as specified in a 2x2 two two matrix. This is our overall density plot. And now I want to use Dippler, specifically the pipeline approach and the filter function, to only include vehicles that have a four that have four cylinders. And I'm going to store the relevant rows, the relevant columns that fit this criteria into a new data frame called SIL4. So using the pipeline approach, I specify my data frame, I use the pipe, and then I'm going to call the filter function. And for every value in the variable SIL, short for cylinder, that equals equals, and this is a logical condition, the value of 4, which is a level or a factor value, it's going to return a true, and it will store that row and all relevant columns in my newly created data frame, SIL4. So let's run that. So it's pulling from MT cars, and let's take a look at the cylinder column. We only have four in the cylinder column, which is what we wanted. And as you can see, the filter variable, it disregarded cylinders that weren't four, and it included all the, all the columns since we didn't specify to drop or keep certain columns, we wanted all the columns that matched cars having four cylinders. We'll plot that alongside in our 2x2 two two matrix layout of our plot display. And here we have four cylinder vehicles and their density plot. We'll do the same for six cylinder vehicles. And here we have six cylinder vehicles and their density plots. And we'll do the same for eight cylinder vehicles because in our cylinder variable we had three levels four, six, and eight cylinders, nothing more, nothing less. And we'll plot our eight cylinder density plot. And here we well. have our density plots laid in a two by two matrix layout with four elements on it, or four plots on it, since we have a matrix layout for a plot design. Similarly, for a box plot, we're going to have four elements or a two by two matrix layout design. And all I have to do is use the box plot function. No fancy options. We're just going to plot the spreads of our overall distribution and our subpopulations dependent on cylinder or the number of cylinders in a car. So here we have our box plots. And one way to interpret a box plot is that inside the box, you have the first outer line representing the 25th percentile, the middle line representing the 50th percentile or the median, and the outer third line representing the 75th percentile. Well, if you take the value representing the 75th percentile, and that appears to be about, for all vehicle miles per gallon, probably about 23 miles per gallon, and subtract it from the first quartile, which looks like it's 15, you have 23 minus 15, which is 8 miles per gallon. That 8 miles per gallon is called the IQR, or the interquartile range. And the IQR is simply the third quartile minus the first quartile. And we use the IQR in calculating these whiskers. It's called a box and whisker plot. That form an upper and lower boundary for our box plot. And we use the IQR, or interquartile range, to detect outliers within the data. So again, the box plot, or box and whisker plot to be more exact, is an excellent way of displaying spread, or the way a distribution is laid out, of variables. It shows the outcomes well, and it also shows their spread well. You can tell measures of skewness, whether your data is symmetric, whether outliers exist. So a box and whisker plot is a great tool to have in your statistical visualization tool chest. For this one, we're going to put histograms and overlay them over density plots. Again, we'll lay our 
uh, matrix layout as being a two by two matrix for our plots. And we're going to use the hist function. So I first plot my density uh, charts. And then all I'm going to do is add my histogram to the density plot. Two options that you have to be aware of when we overlay a histogram with a density plot. First is I have to add it to the existing density plot, so this has to be set to true. Secondly, frequencies. There's a difference between frequencies and densities. Frequency is the number of times some value occurs within an interval. Density is respective to a probability density function, so a PDF. So there's a huge difference and frequency is the number of times an outcome occurs within an interval of values. We want that to be set to false because I'm not interested in the number of times something occurs, I'm interested in the histogram density plot. So once I turn frequency, turn it off or set it to false, it's going to resort to density histograms which goes hand in hand with our density curves as shown here. Here we have a density histogram and a density curve. We'll do the same for our remaining subpopulations. And here we have density histograms superimposed or overlaid on top of their density curves. Pretty cool. In our final graphical visualization, we'll be discussing trend lines. Now a trend line is simply a simple linear regression line. In our final example, we'll be discussing trend lines. And we'll be using data from the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, in generating our data. So what is a trend line? Well, if you said it's a line, you'd be correct. It's in its name. But a trend line is essentially a simple linear regression line. So it has one independent variable and one dependent variable. It is a least squares regression line. So going down here for this bit of information, which means it has an intercept and a slope. Now the concept of least squares regression is that you minimize the sum of squared error. So if these sound like foreign terms to you, don't worry. We'll get to them in later videos. But it's all about minimizing the distance between an outcome and the line. And an outcome just represents an observation. I'll clarify more once we see the graph. But in setting up this example, we'll have our independent variable on our x-axis be years, and our dependent variable, the thing we're trying to predict, be average global temperature. We'll call that globe temp. And that'll be on the y-axis as our dependent variable. So for years, I have 2007 all the way to 2016. And when I use the colon, that means I want to increment by one, or in this case, one year, until reaching 2016. So that's stored in a vector. Globe temp, average globe temp. Here I have this stored in a 1 by 10 or a 10 by 1 vector, whatever you want to call it. And in order to specify the linear trend line or the linear regression line, we're going to use the LM function. And the LM function stands for linear model. The linear model produces a ton of results because regression is all about interpretation, design, and making sure things work together as necessary. So a linear model accounts for random variation in your data. You're never going to have a perfect line that reaches all the points unless you have a perfect correlation. And since that doesn't happen in most real world cases, we have to account for random variation. In specifying this regression line, I have globe temp as my dependent variable, so that goes first. And I specify the end of the things I'm trying to predict with a tilde. And then I start my independent variable, or variables if you're doing multiple regression. And I specify my independent variable years after the tilde. And we're going to store all relevant information in the object called reg1. When I open up this object, I see that I have 12 different objects contained within a list, and that list is reg1. I want to obtain the coefficients. So the coefficients form the regression line, and it's formed from an intercept and a slope. So printing that out, and I can access this 
the coefficients by simply using the dollar sign notation, reg1 dollar sign coefficients, I can access those two values. And I can see on my output that my intercept is negative 81.1. And my slope for my independent variable and predicting my dependent variable is 0.041, rounding up. A key thing that I want you to take away from this, even if you don't understand the regression concept, is how to interpret the slope. So in this case, 0.041 represents our slope, and this is how you define it. With each additional year, so we're increasing by one year, the temperature will increase on average, that's a hugely important term, by 0.041 degrees Celsius. So the regression line is simply a line of averages. It's not going to get the exact points unless you have a perfect correlation between your independent and dependent variables. But what it's going to provide is a best fit line that contains the average values and that shows, as our example implies, a trend in your data. Is it a perfect trend? No. Will random variation corrupt that trend? Absolutely. But what the trend line does is it shows that on average, with each additional year, I can expect my temperature to increase by 0.041 degrees Celsius. So let's plot that so we have a better display, or a better interpretation. I'm going to use the PAR function. I only want a one by one matrix, which means I want the entire plot display to feature this one graph. And we're going to create a scatter plot of points and connect them to the line. The way I do that is I specify type equals O and that's going to put the points on there and connect each point by a line. Years is our independent variable, so it goes on our x-axis, and globe temp is our dependent variable, so it goes on our y-axis. And when I plot this, here we have point one connected to point two, 2007 to 2008, and each value, right, it's a coordinate pair, so for 2007 the average global temperature was about I can see 0 0.36 degrees Celsius and that's connected to a line there. So we can't really pick out a, chen a trend from this graph so let's add a b line and add the information from our regression which we stored in reg 1 to the plot and we'll color it red. So this here represents our trend line and remember what I said about interpreting, interpreting the slope. With each additional year the temperature will increase on average by 0 0.041 degrees Celsius. So the trend line does not accurately show the real values. It only represents a line of averages. It's the best fit line that minimizes the distance from this line, from this point to the line. So we call it the best fit least squares linear regression line. And in this case, all it shows is a linear trend of increasing global temperatures with each additional year. Congratulations! You just finished Chapter 2. We did a lot of stuff this chapter, including the basics of our programming, a bit of mathematical stuff with R, and now we were introduced to statistical concepts using R. In the next chapter, Chapter 3, we'll be going more in depth on statistical concepts, foundations, distributions, and many, many other things that we can do with R in terms of statistical theory and applications. I look forward to seeing you soon, and again, be sure to check out our videos. Thanks again, I'm Ryan Laffler, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.